Hey everybody, this is Brian. Hope everybody's doing well. I'm actually back uh, in Florida, which is where I live. I was in New York City last week for work and it's nice to be home for a couple of days. But I wanted to um, do a video talking about my uh, Todd Chrisley interview. And uh, if you're not familiar with who Todd Chrisley is, there's the show Chrisley Knows Best, uh, which was like a, a really popular show on, uh, on cable for about 10 years. My mom actually loved the show. So that's kind of how I knew about it. Um, like around the holidays, my mom would like be binge watching it and I would see it. And um, if you don't know the show, it's basically this family. They're originally from Georgia and um, sort of have this lavish lifestyle. And long story short, the parents, Todd and Julie Chrisley, uh, ended up getting indicted and convicted on um, tax and bank fraud charges. Todd Chrisley, the dad, was... Uh, sentenced to 12 years in federal prison. It was reduced to 10, I believe. And then Julie, her sentence was, I think, seven years, and it was reduced to five. Um, and I ended up, if you've been watching News Nation, I did this uh, story where we heard from Todd Chrisley behind bars. It's interesting. I got some heat from it. Um, some of you, people on Twitter and stuff saying, like, you know, there's so many important stories out there. Why did you take the time to do the story about this rich guy who went to prison and I'm gonna explain that later in this video kind of in more detail but I didn't do it just about Todd Chrisley I did it because I thought it was really interesting what he says is happening inside the federal prison system he's in the federal prison in Pensacola Florida and I've done stories on I used to work local news in Miami about um, what goes on behind bars and uh, you know I that's why I was interested. The fact that if there's, you know, issues happening behind bars where people are, you know, being hurt and not getting food and that kind of thing, I, I think it's interesting that he's exposing that. Um, I also think his story is interesting too, but honestly, I was more interested in what's happening in federal prison and the stuff that we never really hear about. He's at the federal prison camp, again, Pensacola. Um, I first, through his attorney, gave us permission to interview him in prison. We put in all the paperwork. Uh, his lawyer said we could go in prison and interview him, and that got denied. I actually have an email here from the Bureau of Prisons. They said, our policy-based reason for this denial is listed um, in part, the interview in the opinion of the warden would probably cause serious unrest or disturb the good order of the institution. So that's the reason that they said officially we couldn't go into the prison to interview Todd Chrisley. Um, I thought it was interesting because we knew that Chrisley was making all these accusations about the prison, that the food was expired and, you know, not good for human consumption, that it's like really, really awful food, that there were rats and that a dead cat fell out of the ceiling. And you'll hear all that in a minute. And that, you know, the elderly inmates aren't getting the medical care they need. So when they denied me access into the prison, kind of just like as a reporter, you get more interested. Like, well, why aren't they letting me in? Is, is it really because we would cause unrest and disturb the good order of the institution like would anyone even really know we're doing the interview other inmates i don't really know what they meant by that um so i ended up being able to hear from todd through his attorney um and you're going to hear these sound bites in a second i never uh reached out to todd directly and i just want to make this clear because i don't want him to get in trouble with the prison system for that reason because we never reached out to Todd Chrisley directly um, this was all through his attorney um, we were able to ask questions and then his attorney was able to you know ask those questions of Todd so um, that's sort of the way this this went down uh, I just want to make make that clear because a lot of people are saying oh you got this you know interview with Todd Chrisley behind bars it wasn't exactly like that. Yes, but it it wasn't it wasn't through Todd. This was all through his attorney, um, and he made some pretty wild accusations about the prison. I want to play uh, this first this first clip from uh, from Todd Chrisley. Do you feel like you're being treated fairly by the guards and and the prison staff? No, no. There are recordings of staff members here talking about. Um, he needs to be humble. What we need to do is we need to put him in diesel therapy and put him in shackles and let him ride around the country for four months and then bring him back and that will humble him. He thinks this is one of his mansions that he used to live in, but this is be okay. That's what's on the record. There was a photograph taken of me while I was sleeping and sent to my daughter uh, asking for $2,600 to 
hours at night for my protection. Wow. Um, what about the food, Todd? I mean, Savannah has talked about the food. Um, can you, uh, you know, is it unsafe? It is so disgustingly filthy. The food is literally, I'm not exaggerating, the food is dated, it, it's out of date by at minimum a year. It's a year past expiration. And they are literally starving these men to death here. These men are getting, I don't know that they're getting a thousand calories a day. So what are you eating if, if you're not eating the food? The only food that I eat is what I make that I buy from commissary. One of the one of the warden's ways of kind of I've been told this by a staff member. One of the ways that she's trying to break me is by cutting down what you can buy in commissary. So before she came here, you could buy twelve packs of tuna a week. She cut it down to six, then it went from six to three. She is not given a reason. She says when I ask her about it, she says commissary is a privilege, not a right. So do you only eat tuna? I eat tuna. I eat peanut butter. Uh, that's where I get protein. I eat like a pasta salad that I make, pasta that I get in commissary. And then I start over again doing the same thing the next week. You've got rats. You've got squirrels in the, in the storage facility where the food is. They just covered it up with plastic and tore the ceiling out because of all the black mold and found de a, a dead cat in the ceiling that dropped down on the, on the top of the food. My gosh. So they're not letting you in here because it's a, it, it, it's a breach of security or whatever. They don't want you in here where you can see what's really going on. So you heard Todd there talking about the conditions behind bars. Um, and, uh, you know, I've gotten a lot of comments from people who have been in prisons and federal prisons and county jails who are not really that surprised. Uh, there was a lot of interest, too, in, um, you know, his wife, Julie, is also in prison. She's at a different prison in Kentucky. And they've been married for decades, but they're not allowed to communicate, which I never really realized, at least on the phone. Like, I would have thought they'd be allowed to talk on the phone, you know, as a married couple, but that's not the way it works. They're allowed to send emails back and forth, but... Todd claims those emails have been delayed. He also claims he hasn't always been able to talk to his attorney when he needs to. Uh, but I asked um, about that with the lawyer, and he said, yeah, there have been some delays uh, in terms of you know him being able to talk to Todd. But this is what Todd had to say uh, about um, his communication with his wife, Julie, who again is in prison in Kentucky. You and Julie have been together for decades. What has it been like not being able to communicate with her? It's devastating. Uh, she and I email, you know, four and five times a day, but they will hold my emails and hold them on her end as well as a way of punishment to us because of what Savannah's doing. So if I write her an email today, if I write her three or four, because I work out, then I go to the computer and I send all of my kids an email every morning, send her an email and just say, I love you, stay strong, God's got us, whatever we're saying. And anyone else's email will go through within two hours. She may not get mine for five days later. Are you ever concerned that maybe you should, I mean, stay quiet? Because you're trying to help other people by speaking out. But it sounds like you talking about what's going on there could end up making your situation worse. I know that there is, God has a greater purpose. I know he's got a greater plan. And I'm not going to let the federal government break my faith. I'm not. They wanted to destroy our family. Tommy Kripp, the prosecutor, stated that we were the southern version of the Trump. I'm not going to have someone like him break my family. And that's what he wanted to do, but he, he's not been able to do that. So that was all uh, interesting. But I guess what I walked away from this most interested in is the food was interesting the fact that he says the food is so bad and, and again i'm not so much interested in it just not being good because you're in prison but the fact that um it's expired and potentially dangerous according to him but also the fact that he says that there are other inmates there's a lot of elderly inmates he says because this is a prison where there's a lot of people who are behind bars for like money laundering and medicare fraud and that kind of thing he says that there are elderly inmates who aren't getting the medical care they need and he shared some really alarming stories of what he says he's seen firsthand um let's listen to that part they 
they treat this man like a piece of garbage. And the man fell in the hallway in our in our dorm, and he hit his head. And then keep in mind, he got up because he was bleeding from, he was literally bleeding from his rectum and throwing up blood. So it was all down the back of his pants, all in the floor. So when I got up the next morning, because he's on the other side of the dorm to me, and um, so he woke, he opened his eyes and he said, I'm so happy to see you. Oh. <laughs> mm. <laughs> but I need help. I got up and I went to the office and I said, y'all need to call an ambulance from him. I said, or he's going to die. She got up, she came back there. She said, can you walk to medical? And I looked at her and I said, what do you mean, can he walk? She said, well, I'll just go and call medical to come and get him. They took him to the hospital after keeping him up in medical for like five hours. But the only reason they took him is because he passed out in medical. They took him and had to do brain surgery on him. Cut his skull open in two places eight inches long to stop the, the bleeding on the brain. They brought him back here after about four days with staples in his head. And he was hurting so bad and all they told him was to take Tylenol. They didn't have the prescription. The doctor had not called the prescription in. So the man lay here in his bed with these, these staples in his head in excruciating pain. And all he could take was over-the-counter headache powder. Mm. I can't believe you've seen all of this and you, you know, in, in a relatively short time since you've been there. Let me tell you something. You would see it if you walked in here today. Why do you think they won't allow you in here? I want to bring in um, Allison Weiner. She's the senior producer on the story. She's also my friend. Uh, and she um, happens to be in Italy right now uh, on a trip. So if her, yeah, if her, uh, connection looks a little weird or gets frozen for a second that that's the reason why just so you guys know but i wanted to bring you in allison because first of all you know everything about the story because you were doing all the work behind the scenes but also since we first did the story like i've gotten some heat from people saying um like why are you putting attention to this rich reality star there's so many more important things out there and you know and more important cases that you should be covering and i get that i mean there's so many cases that don't get the coverage um and I want to look into them all, but I, I think that I was most interested in this story just because I've done other stories in the past, especially when I was in local news about prison conditions. And it's not, I mean, for us, it wasn't just about Todd Chrisley. Um, in fact, like I was more interested in the whole issue beyond Todd Chrisley. Like, you know, if what he's saying is true, um, it impacts a lot more people than than just Todd Chrisley. I think, and I think it's what actually also drew me to the story, um, and I know you've done a lot of work in this area, but I think that the thing about what Todd was doing is he's talking about conditions that affect a lot of prisoners, and I think it is incumbent upon us to talk about prison conditions. I think there's a fallacy that because it's a federal prison that is for financial crimes mostly, and that it's not a place where they put murderers or more violent felons, that it would be very relaxed there's tennis you know sort of that kind of cliche that people say club fed and basically what we're finding out and what we found out from Todd Chrisley is that it's it's really got some serious problems with food with medical care so I think those are important issues because well whatever you think about Todd Chrisley you want to you do care about everybody in the prison system they're entitled to basic human rights and it sounds like some of those uh, based on our reporting, are being violated. What we've heard from Mr. Chrisley, what we've heard from his daughter, Savannah, what we've heard from his attorney, there's some serious problems at Pensacola prison camp. Mm. And I get like people when you're talking about murderers and child molesters, and it's hard to have a lot of sympathy, but with, and I, I mean, financial crimes are serious too, um, but I think there is something different <sighs> You know, there's a lot of people that go to prison, especially this prison in Pensacola, who um, may be guilty of their crimes, but, you know, still deserve, you know, food that is edible and, you know, not to have be living in like squalor. Well, compare this to Brian Koberger, who's charged with four murders. Yeah. And he's in a 
jail in Moscow, Idaho, and they're giving him, you know, vegan meals. It's nothing that great, but they are trying to respect and make sure that his basic rights are being met, um, that he's safe, even though he's segregated from the other population, that he is um, being fed, that uh, he just has basic accommodations. And, no, you know, that's the way it's supposed to be. And this is somebody who's committed a far more serious crime. I mean, you've reported about that. Yeah, no, that's a really interesting comparison. You're right. And we've had sources who, you know, have told us about with Koberger, like you said, the vegan meals. I mean, they go out of their way to make sure that he's treated fairly. Um, we got a statement from the Bureau of Prisons in relation to the Pensacola prison. Um, it was a long statement and I'll post the whole thing, but basically just saying that they follow all the standards, that there's strict guidelines. Um, and again, having done some stories in the past about this, I mean, they're critically underfunded, um, the federal prison system. And a lot of the county jails are too. You know, it's like, I think when you're a lawmaker, it's not easy to sign off on a bill that gives lots and lots of money to prisons because people don't really care. So I'm sure it's difficult for these prisons to operate the way they're supposed to when they're, they probably don't have the resources. I think that's true. And I think you reported also about, I mean, the escapes that are happening, the yeah. lack of staff, the lack of oversight. But I think in this case, the things that we were highlighting or that you were highlighting in this story that we worked on were about expired food. I mean, we can do better than that. People shouldn't be, the food should be dated appropriately. Now, the prison, as you said, it sent us a letter saying that they serve, they, that expired food is not served to inmates. It directly contradicted what Todd Chrisley said. Um, and the other issue is medical care. And I think even for people that committed financial crimes or committed murder or what, you know, it, it, like I said, Brian Koberger is able to have a, a, a service uh, every yeah. week or meet with a, a chaplain. And Todd uh, Chrisley is talking about people who are ill that aren't getting basic medical care. Yeah, and you're a lawyer. I didn't get a chance to get to this much in the story up until this point, just because we had so much. But he also, um, through his attorney, and we talked to his attorney, Todd Chrisley's attorney a lot, Jay Sturgeon, has said um, that uh, he's not been able to have regular phone calls with his lawyers, which is... Isn't that like against the Constitution, essentially? Yes, it that's is. True? I mean, you are entitled. You are entitled to um, uh, the right to counsel, and that uh, Jay um, Surgeon, who is one of his attorneys, and he also has appellate attorneys. But Jay Surgeon was having difficulty. He had to schedule the call with Todd Chrisley to, you know, to arrange to speak with him. It was months. It was months. It took forever. So, I mean, and and he speaks to him about once every two weeks. Initially, it was a lot more often. Uh, I, I think it's it's really troublesome. And the idea that you can't reach an attorney that you have to, they don't have, I think part of the problem is what you're talking about, that maybe they don't have enough staff to schedule those calls. But it just seems to me, it seems to, it should seem to everyone that how can that be? You have, that should be one of the priorities, just like medical care and decent or safe food that you're being fed. Yeah. Um, and you've been working on this story since the beginning behind the scenes. A lot of people in Cuomo, when we did it on his show, brought this up. I mean, a lot of people are saying, gosh, like this is going to get Todd in a worse situation. I mean, you're speaking out against the prison system where you're being held. It is kind of interesting. Like, um, you know, I I just I hope we don't cause more problems here. But at the same time, I think, you know, we're just trying to get the word out, you know. I think, though, that um, it was kind of admirable that despite what might happen to him, that he was using this voice he got through this television show and the attention that that gives him from the media uh, to speak through his attorney to us about the conditions in that prison and that affect other people besides him. I mean, really, he was talking to people with some serious medical issues that weren't being addressed. Yeah, and that's not something he has to do. That's just going to bring him, you know, possible retribution. And I think Cuomo was right. And you were right about this. It's something that is is concerning, but it does take, you know, I mean, you have to step back and say, wow, that's that's kind of brave, don't you think? Yeah, and I mean, some of the stories he told about, um, you know, what, what I just played about, you know, other elder, there's a lot of elderly people, he says, inside this prison 
um, you know, finance that committed financial crimes years ago that are suffering, it sounds like medically, not getting the treatment that they need. Uh, so it's interesting. I think, again, that's what I was drawn to with the story the most um, beyond just Todd Chrisley was. And look, I mean, my mom loved the show. I was interested in talking to him. But but what I thought really made it a story for us was that it was opening up a bigger issue, you know, and it's interesting, kind of like people on Twitter who have had a family member behind bars um, have really like uh, sent a lot of messages to me. I mean, they, I think they're connecting to this. And again, I'm not talking about like child molesters and murderers and people who it's hard to have sympathy for. I'm just talking. There's a lot of people who do make mistakes, you know, that yeah, are not here. To, we're not here to advocate uh, for innocence or guilt or yeah, anything. Exactly. Like that. He's, he's been convicted. He has an appeal that is pending. That's going to be there. have granted oral argument in the 11th circuit. So his appeal is going to be her that means that the it's a very rare thing that the attorneys are going to be able to argue on his behalf in person generally an appellate court in most of the cases just reads the briefs so that's a big deal that they have granted um the oral argument and the for the appeal but we're not advocating in that sense what we were struck by and i know you and i really we talked about this a lot was the fact that there are people, elderly people in there with dementia, which a lot mm. of Americans are dealing with with their parents right now um, and, you know, extended family. There's a big group of the population that is aging. You know, there's the boomers become older and older and that we are we're dealing with this aging population and that these people with dementia, it's they're not getting basic medical care, which means supervision for people with dementia, helping yeah. them to stay clean, helping them, you know, to change, to get to the bathroom, those kinds of things. Uh, you know, I don't I don't think that many Americans would be in favor of people with dementia continuing and not being put in a special area where there are people that know how to care for people with dementia. It's really that was very striking to me. And I, I it was a terrible thing when he was talking about it because they don't know where they are. They have hallucinations. This is these are all symptoms and a part of dementia, um, Alzheimer's, yeah. whatever, you know, and and that kind of spoke to me. I mean, what what are they going to be you know doing to somebody? You know, why isn't there some sort of help for these people? Yeah, no, totally. Well, Allison, you're definitely. uh my secret weapon with a lot of these stories. So thank you for all your help. Um, and thank you for taking time away from your trip. And uh, I want to play, you brought up the appeal. Um, I want to play some of the interview with uh, Chris Lee's attorney. Um, and uh, he explained some of the appeal. So take a listen. Our criminal justice system, I believe has let them down. Um, I, I believe that, uh, that they're gonna have a chance now before the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals. And we're gonna, I think we're gonna be able to argue that effectively and, uh, and correct an injustice that shouldn't have existed to begin with. Is it true that one of the investigators had Todd Chrisley's head on a dartboard? Yeah, sad but true. I heard the same thing that, um, that the Chrisleys were targeted and that there was an agent from the Georgia Department of Revenue that actually had uh, um, them, uh, Todd's picture, uh, like it was a target, and he was uh, aiming at it. So that was uh, Todd Chrisley's attorney, um, who is concerned, obviously, he says about uh, the way Todd has been treated in prison, but also um, the whole process in general. Uh, he says that, you know, they're pretty confident in this appeal. They got the oral arguments, so they'll be able to uh, argue them in Georgia. Um, and, you know, they're hoping that they can get a new trial or that the charges will get thrown out. We'll follow that closely. In terms of the conditions inside the prison, we did reach out to the Bureau of Prisons, um, just generally asking them about some of these claims that have been made about the conditions. And they sent us a pretty long statement. I'll just kind of sum it up for you. Um, they say that the facilities are safe, secure, and humane, that that's their mission. They take seriously their duty, um, that the quality of the food served to our incarcerated individual population is a priority. Food service mission is to provide healthy, nutritionally sound, and appetizing meals. That's interesting. Uh, that meet the needs of every individual. Um, 
and uh, expired food is discarded and not utilized, that medical, dental, and mental health services uh, are consistent with accepted community standards for a correctional environment. So they basically stood by their practices inside the prison. Um, and, and the statement went on and on, but that was basically the, the gist of it. Uh, I also spoke with Savannah Chrisley, who if you watch the show is Todd and Julie's daughter. Uh, and she's really made it a, a, a mission of hers and a passion of hers to speak out for the incarcerated. Um, and again, regardless of kind of whether you believe that Todd and Julie are innocent or not, this is kind of the part I'm more interested in. The fact that they are making these claims about what life is really like behind bars and whether that's acceptable. And if you follow Savannah Chrisley on social media, um, which is one of the reasons I first heard about this story, uh, you'll see she's posting a lot about conditions in the prison and, you know, that conditions for inmates should be taken more seriously, which I just found interesting because when I used to watch the show with my mom, you know, she was kind of just like this young, rich girl and, um, you know, worried about like clothes and dating and all of that stuff. And it is interesting to see her now um, so focused on something pretty serious. And she's also had to take custody of the younger kids in the family now that her parents are in prison. So I wanted to post, if you've been watching News Nation, you saw some of my clips with Savannah, but I wanted to post a longer extended uh, version. Uh, so check it out. Through, uh, through his lawyer, uh, you know, we were able to get some information from your dad about what, what life is like. And I mean, the stories that he has are really disturbing mm -hmm. in terms of what's happening to other prisoners, um, the conditions. It literally gives me chills, like, as yeah. you say that. And he even got emotional um, during that discussion with his lawyer there, yeah. talking about, you know, a man who he was helping to take care of, who, mm -hmm. and then, you know, another man who had brain surgery. I mean, just, it's like awful, awful. It's awful, uh, especially where dad is at. It's funny, uh, years back, the facility dad's at was labeled as Camp Cupcake. That's what a lot of people know it as. And they're like, oh, they've got a swimming pool. They have this, that. All of that is a lie. They have none of that. And sure, I'm not sitting here speaking to you, asking for the world to have sympathy at all. Not at all. I've lived a very privileged life. So I don't expect people to say, oh, I feel bad for her. Um, but what I am, my mission is for people to look at this and open their eyes to something bigger than themselves. Because I was in that position. I didn't care. It didn't affect my life. In my brain, I was like, I've got enough going on in my life as it is, so I can't focus on things that don't affect me. But now that I'm in it, it's made me realize that that viewpoint is, it's, it's, it's a very ignorant viewpoint. Because just because something doesn't affect you doesn't mean you shouldn't care about it. And now that I'm in it, fully in it, and I see how these men are being treated, it causes me to take a step back and it's like, okay, why are more people not speaking about this? I mean, like, as you said, dad's had plenty of conversations with his lawyers because he's like, how some of these men, he's like, I want, some of these men need to be out of here. They, they shouldn't be here. You've got these elderly men that have served over 50% of their sentences or, you know, even more than that. And they either have dementia, Alzheimer's, they can't even take care of themselves and yet they're in a facility to where they don't care. And now these other inmates are taking an elderly man to the bathroom. They're walking around with him because he's looking for his daughter. He's walking around looking for his daughter. Now, at what point do we step in and we say, okay, this was a white collar crime. They did not, no one was physically hurt. No one, whatever the crime may be, you look at it and you're like, all right, is this, making society a better place. And in my mind, it's like, it, it's not. You don't realize the effect that it makes. Sure, I'm not sitting here saying, there are victims of people who, whether it's financial or what, that need to be, you know, that needs to be made right. But at the same time, I guarantee you, if you sat down with some of these victims, they would say, I don't want that person being treated that way. And when you go into these prisons, you're, these men and women are eventually going to get out. Whether you like it or not, they're going to get out. They're going to be your neighbor. So if you don't want to do it for them, then selfishly do it for yourself. Because do you want them getting out 
being exactly how they were when they went in? Or do you want them to come out and be rehabilitated and to see life in a different perspective? And when I look at it, it's like, well, treating them like animals, you're treating them like animals. Why do you expect them to get out and treat people any differently than you treated them? And that's the tough part because we just don't have a system that is made for rehabilitation. You know, under the Trump administration, the First Step Act was huge. It was a huge reform. And, but unfortunately, the BOP doesn't have enough intellect to implement the First Step Act. So you have all these men and women that should have been, they're in prison past the time they should have been released because their credits aren't being applied properly. So I know at my dad's facility, there's at least 40 men that are sitting there when they should have gone home months ago. So it's just sad because it seems like it's just a rat race and no one knows what they're doing from one person to the next. When did you realize that this, I mean, you obviously knew prison was gonna be different than the lifestyle you mm -hmm. guys were used to, but when did you realize um, that, it's, that there's actually serious problems? Was it pretty early on? Going into it, I, like, I heard Camp Cupcake. All right, federal prison is gonna be great. You know, that's, that's like the misconception. Federal prison's great compared to these state prisons, which makes me sad to say that it is better, which is even more alarming for these state facilities. And it was very, it was very early on. I mean, luckily there were some people there at dad's facility that it was very well known. I, I, our case was very well known. People knew they were coming there. I've spoken to men who have since left there and they're like, oh, when we, everyone heard he was coming here, months before like everyone was freaking out they knew of him and the case and then when he got there there were some people that were very helpful very helpful and wanting to help him adjust and then there were guards correctional officers that were like oh we're gonna in their words and their exact words we're going to humble his ass was their exact wording and obviously if you look at the bop handbook that's they're all ready going against their own rules that has been that have been set forth for them which is sad because they are now you know they are trying to scare inmates they're they're just lording over them in a way that you're just not allowed to do so i learned very early on that you have to watch how you step you and you can't upset these correctional officers or else they retaliate which obviously we've gone completely against the grain and we have upset every single one of well, them. Well that's what I was going to ask you are you yeah. worried because I'm sure some people have advised you like just stay quiet mm -hmm. wait till he gets out I and mean, this can't be making life easier no for your parents. No not at all and I would not be doing what I'm doing now if they weren't okay with it and we've looked at it and you know fortunately enough we have the resources to be able to fight this battle that we're on. And it hasn't been easy. It's not like, oh, okay, there's millions of dollars here to just spend on attorneys and all these different things. We've had to fight our way through the whole thing. There are tons of people who don't have that ability. They just have to take what's thrown at them and this is what it is and I have to serve my sentence and so be it. And that's how we look at it is we want to fight we want to make what has happened. We want to make something good of it. So if mom and dad's life being difficult right now, they, they can endure that if it means that there's going to be lasting change that comes from it. Is your mom's situation any better? Hers, it's not. It's kind of weird how you, when you look at the system, where dad's at is there's tons of doctors, lawyers, I mean, very, I mean, there's some great men that are there in his facility. Where mom's at, it's, that's a misconception about their facilities. It's, oh, it's just white collar crime. That is not true. And especially at mom's facility. There are a lot of drug crimes and a few violent crimes that women are serving out their sentences there. And her facility, it's just, Dad's is terrible, but hers makes his look pretty great. Really? Yeah. 
So hers is worse. Hers is worse. Um, her so where her facility is at, it's actually on a old poppy field, and it was condemned, and then they turned it into a federal prison camp. And what people don't realize is, you know, I had a correctional officer there tell me that even the drinking water, he brought testing strips to work one day and tested the water before he drank it and drugs showed up in the water. Mm -hmm. So you look at it and you're like, wow, this, but yet, and then in commissary, they'll run out of bottled water to sell the men and women. So you can't even supply them with clean drinking water, which is an issue. And that's my thing. It goes down to basic human rights. Despite I've had people come at me from all different angles and they're like, well, all these people are criminals. They deserve what they get. I, I don't roll with that because at the end of the day, our society is judged how we treat the people within our prisons. So we, you at least deserve basic human rights, clean drinking water, food that is not expired and that doesn't have bugs in it, that doesn't, just the bare necessities you at least should have. I'm just thinking about you from the show um, and the things that you were worried about and talking about mm -hmm. then, which wasn't that long ago, yeah. versus you now. Mm -hmm. And it's just so different. Yes, it is. I think it's so easy. It's, we're no stranger to making it all, like making it to the top, losing it all, building it back. And I think that's what life's about. Like you learn some of your biggest lessons at the bottom, like in the midst of all the trials and tribulations, you learn some of the biggest lessons. So that's why I look at this and it's like, sure, I wish I would take anything for my parents to not be where they're at. But at the same time, it's taught my siblings and I so many lessons and also life is more than just yourself and that's kind of what I'm that's what I'm proud of when I look at this and I realize that God has a bigger plan his plan is sure I may not be the most educated I have grown up on TV but that doesn't mean that you can't educate yourself and you can't look to people to educate you on something that you know nothing about do you find out who your real friends are? I mean, I'm just thinking you're in this, you know, high class life and on TV and all the cool, mm -hmm. you know, things you own and trips and everything. And I mean, do people drop you when something like this happens? For sure. I think for us, obviously, with the, you, you find out who are the real people and because so I, there are so many things I have to tiptoe around, but even just the show you know, canceled like that. You bring a network, millions and millions and millions of dollars. And then when something bad happens, it's like, all right, on to the next. And that's life, you know, there's always bigger and better out there. But when it comes to friends, I have definitely, my circle's gotten smaller and for that I'm grateful. And there's also been people in my life who have shown up that I never expected to show up. I was kind of surprised the show was canceled because I mean, to me, this all makes your family more interesting. Mm -hmm. I mean, you've become a more interesting, deep person. Yes. Like, it seems like it would have, you know, made for an interesting show. Well, if it says anything, even after the show was canceled and all advertisements stopped, our show was still in the top 10 highest rated on cable television. So I think that speaks for itself. All advertisements stopped, show canceled, but there was still half a season of episodes to air. So they just figured, all right, we'll air them. We won't promote it, anything. And it was still top 10 highest rated on cable television. So it just goes to show at the, end of the, at the end of the day, especially after COVID, people are wanting something to believe in. They're wanting to see people's stories. They want to see depth in it. There's nothing, sure, people saw us as this funny family who had it all together. But in reality, people want to know you're just like them. I mean, I'm no stranger to having to, you know, I'm a single parent now. Really, how you look at it, sure, I'm their sister, but I'm also a single parent. And I'm a single income household. I'm trying to get two kids through school and just healthcare, all these different things. So I know what it's like to have to sit there and think, 
oh shoot, like, how do I need to budget this month? How do I need to get through this month? Because my life's completely changed. And yeah, it's hard to imagine based on the show. For sure. Think, you thinking about that. Exactly, because I was like a normal 20 something year old who got money and I was just living life. I thought it was never gonna end. And then on top of it, also getting to a place to where now we're in the midst of this appeal and there are, there's tons of money that has to be spent. So I'm going to spend whatever I have to spend in order to bring justice to my parents. You always seem so positive though. I mean, is that, is that just something you put on? I mean, at no. home, are you like crying? I mean, yeah, I, I go through my phases. It really is. I say it's, it's a form of grief. You're grieving the life of someone who's still alive which is tough um, and there are times to where I do really, really good. I, my therapist says it best. She's like, Santa, it's high functioning depression. That's what it is. And so I can continue to move. It doesn't mean that it's not hurting me and it's not affecting me. But at the end of the day, I put one foot in front of the other and I keep going. And you just, I have my breakdowns for sure. Especially there are some days that are just really heavy. And whether it's something happening in life, and I'm like, oh, I just wish I could pick up the phone and call my mom. Like, she would know exactly what to tell me. And you don't have that. And that's another thing is when you look at our system, sure, I'm not, for people who are in prison, I'm not saying, oh, you shouldn't, they should just live like they would in the outside world. Not at all. But how can you better a system to keep families together? How can you better a system to where children of incarcerated parents aren't more likely to become drug addicts, drug dealers, suffer from anxiety, depression, suicide, teen pregnancy. All of these things are statistically proven. So what can we do in our system to lessen that? I didn't realize that um, your parents wouldn't ever be able to, allowed to talk. Mm -hmm. And th again, how you're, you're just ripping marriages apart. You are, luckily for my parents, that's not an issue because they do, they're finally able to email back and forth. Um, but you look at these men and women that are in prison, and I would say well over 50, 60% end up in divorce. And what are we doing? You have a director who's saying she wants to keep families together, but meanwhile, meanwhile everything that's being implemented speaks complete opposite of that. Yeah, how difficult is it for your parents not? It's tough because my parents weren't the type to really have friends. Like they, they had their close friends they would talk to on the phone, but they weren't vacationing. They weren't having girls trips, guys trips. They did everything together. There was never a point in time where I had to worry, oh, is mom coming home? Is dad coming home? They were together at all times. So it's tough. I mean, 27 years of marriage and you've never gone a day without speaking to each other. Do you feel like your family uh, was treated unfairly, was made an example of? That, yes, yes. And I know that that will cause a lot of ruffled feathers because people look at us and they're like, why should we feel bad for you? Look at the life you lived. You flaunted this, you flaunted that, whatever it may be. And unfortunately, that is the world of reality television, is how a production company or network wants to make something look. Uh, there were so many times where we begged and pleaded, let us just be true and authentically ourselves. Let us tell what's going on, and we weren't allowed to do it. But when it comes to our case in particular, you look back years ago, my dad, became very outspoken. Obviously we were, had a whole other case with the Georgia Department of Revenue. And we came, when we came out about that, he was very vocal on his Instagram, he was posting. There were people coming forward who had audio recordings of these government officials that were talking about our case, that were talking about destroying evidence, that were just, it goes on and on and on. And he started outing these things and he called in, um, he called a lot of people into question, such as the governor and other government officials, and it ruffled a lot of feathers. And I think along the way, he created a lot of enemies. And unfortunately, that's what politics is. You create enemies, and the truth may never end up being on your side when that happens. And even after 
my parents were found guilty, you, there was a press conference, and people can go and watch it. And one of the exact words were, if these people on reality television can't get away with it, neither can you. So I feel like they used our case to try to make an example of and scare people. And whatever their tactics were, clearly in the moment they worked. I feel like people who even don't like your parents or think that they did it uh, are still surprised by the sentences. Mm -hmm. Especially when you watch TV and you hear about people doing all sorts of other really awful, violent crimes mm -hmm. um, that, you know, it's like a slap on the wrist. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's sad because I feel like our government has begun to put more emphasis on white collar crime than true violent crime, which is very frightening for me, especially as a woman walking out on the streets. Are we, what means more, money or human life? And that can become a very political topic but for me personally, it's, I mean, 12 and seven years for an alleged financial crime. And I say alleged because, again, I will always stand firm in the fact that they did not do these things. And it, it's mind boggling. It's 12 years. You look at it and my dad, 10 years from now, is going to be, what, almost 70 years old? What is that doing? What is that doing for... It, it's just, it does no good. And especially, too, it's funny because you have the government saying, you owe me $17 million. So you're going to take a man who's in his prime of his career, and you're going to throw him in prison, but say you owe me $17 million. How do you think you're ever going to get that money back? You're not. Especially when he's getting out of prison at almost 70 years old. The government is never getting it back. Meanwhile, taxpayers are paying to imprison these men and women. So therefore, our country is just going further and further in debt. Mm. So none of it, there is no rhyme or reason to any of it. And I know you stand by your parents' innocence mm -hmm. very strongly. Um, but are you ever angry? Just like, I'm just thinking, you know, you're in your 20s, you're in your prime. You know, your, your dad was very outspoken. Yes. Ruffled a lot of feathers, as you said. You know, you didn't really choose to even be in the reality world. I mean, you were young when that mm -hmm. all started. Are you ever angry, like, now I'm stuck with all these problems? I think I'm angry at the system because there's never a time to where there's anger towards my parents, by any means, because I live by the motto of your life was mapped out for you before you were ever even conceived. Like, God knew this was going to be a part of our life. And... I'm a very faith-filled person, and I look at it, and I'm like, well, Jesus had the biggest comeback story out of anyone, out of anyone. So he can make anything happen. And I look at it, and I'm like, all right, this is, our, this is the life that was meant for us. Now how do we make the best of it? And my anger comes from a system that's so incredibly broken, and how you have these government officials that are allowed to break law after law after law. Meanwhile, my parents are sitting in prison. And I think that's where my anger comes from, is just seeing the mistreatment of how we live in what's supposed to be the greatest country in the world, the greatest country in the world. But then you look at our federal prison system. I mean, you look at our prison system as a whole. And we, amongst all the NATO countries, I mean, we have the highest recidivism rate. So what are we doing? We're just throwing our men and women in prison and throwing away the key. We're doing nothing to rehabilitate. We're doing nothing to help them. And it's just, it's a system that needs to be completely de deconstructed and built back. So I think that's where my anger comes from. I think a lot of people uh, heard about the, the prison sentence and then just kind of, like you said, the world moves fast now, mm -hmm. moved on. But you know, reading through the appeal, some of the information is really shocking. Yes. Um, I mean, the dartboard that your dad's head was on a mm -hmm. dartboard with the investigator. Yes. So that was the whole thing has been so wild. Yeah. So, I mean, there are judges who have sided with us on a lot of these different topics. And there was a weird obsession. That's all that we can say is like there's a weird obsession that they had with my father. You see in some of these court documents of to where the government illegally seized a warehouse of mom and dads. And one of the agents, who's the agent that's responsible for all of this,
goes into the warehouse and he is sitting on furniture. So he would go back to our show and he would find photos of dad sitting on certain furniture. And then he would go and sit on that same furniture and take a photo and send them side by side. So it was very odd behavior, especially for a government official to do. And this is, is the that. same man who was texting with your sister? Yes. The text you sent me? Yes. And talk about that. I mean, it seemed like he was trying to get information out of it. It was kind of a weird, chummy relationship. Yeah, I mean, court documents speak for themselves. And unfortunately, I wish my older two siblings would have never been involved in all of this. Um, but they were. And this Department of Revenue agent was texting with my older sister. He was texting with her, getting information from her, giving her information. And I mean, for it was in the sentencing um, transcript of them talking about her working with the FBI for over two years. So he had, I don't know if he sought her out, she sought him out, but they had this ongoing relationship, friendship, whatever you want to call it. And he, I, maybe, maybe to give her benefit of the doubt, maybe he manipulated her into giving him information. I don't know. I just know that their involvement was very detrimental to the case. What is your relationship with her like now? Non-existent. Non-existent. Because at the end of the day, what was done was done. I don't care to have apologies. I don't care. That's just the place I'm at in my life right now. And there are things that I say that contradict. So, because how can I be this very faithful person and believe in forgiveness and redemption and all these things, but I won't forgive her? So I see the contradiction in it. I just don't think I'm in a place in my life right now for forgiveness because my life, regardless of what anyone else wants to believe, my life was impacted the most. I went from being 25 to living life, now a single parent, financially taking on the responsibilities of everyone and fighting for my parents to come home. I lost my parents and she and my older brother helped to put them there. So, yeah, I was binging on your podcast the other night, getting ready for this, and I found the podcast with her, yes. which I don't think was really that long ago. I mean, it was less than a year ago, wasn't it? Mm, well, mom and dad have been in prison for almost a year, so it was before they had left. Okay. And that was such a. My dad agreed to do that, and there's always, of course with certain family members, there's always different motives as to why they want to do what they want to do. But I think for so long, my dad wanted to believe that she didn't do all the things that she did. You know, I think he maybe was just playing a mind game with himself of just trying to get past it. And I don't think he ever will. And so I think that was just something we did to try to fake it and try to not ruffle feathers and to love on each other. But looking back, it was probably, I mean, I know for me, I will speak for me personally, feelings wise, it was very fake. Yeah, just because I was thinking when I was watching the podcast, I had already spoken to you and you had sent me the text messages and I was thinking, well, she had seen these mm -hmm. before doing the podcast, you know? Yeah, yeah, well, and I will say, there's a lot of things that I've discovered that I didn't know beforehand because for the first time, I'm looking at our case every step of the way, replaying it all, looking into the documents and the facts and the details. There was a lot of things I feel like my dad didn't tell us to maybe protect our hearts or our relationships, and now I'm seeing it firsthand. Sure, he can tell me something, not tell me something. But when I'm seeing it in writing in front of me, there's no denying it and there's no running from it. Yeah. When it seems like your dad didn't think that he was ever going to end up in prison. So maybe he felt yeah. like he didn't need to yeah. tell you all these 100%. things. 100%. And I think when you look at it that way, he didn't think he was going to end up in prison because he knew what he had done and what he hadn't done. He knew that his former CFO of his company had, I mean, this guy sat on the stand and admitted to committing all these crimes. But 
he gets an immunity deal with the government. You know, he had, I want to say, he got the first immunity deal, and then he lied in his 302 interview. And then they allowed him to revamp his immunity deal. And so he has full immunity from the government. So he can admit to any crime he's committed, and he walks free. But because my parents are who they are, they're the ones that have to suffer for it. Yeah. Were you always this strong? I feel like my whole, part of my life, I feel like a lot of my life I've spent fighting. A lot of my life, just from childhood to TV and all these different things, it's, there's been a lot of fight. So I find, I find my strength and obviously my relationship with my Lord and Savior is where I find a lot of my strength. But also now I feel like I'm stronger than ever because I have two kids watching me. I have two kids who are asking, when are mom and dad going to come home? Do you think mom will be home by my 18th birthday? Do you think all these different questions? And when you have kids asking you that, there's nothing for you to do other than fight. So I refuse to give up the fight. Do you ever think this is a blessing in the sense that if it hadn't happened, um, I'm just thinking if I was sitting here interviewing you, like what would we even talk about? I mean, yeah. like your beauty product. You have a much more serious, um, <coughs> you know, interests now mm -hmm. that actually matter. Yes, for uh, 100%. I mean, not that uh, like beauty products aren't important. No, but you know what I mean. When it comes down to it, no one's gonna look at what you're wearing, how your hair looked, how your makeup looked, what you've created. No one's gonna look at those things. It's gonna come down to what is the impact that you've made in life. How have you made your mark? And this, since this has happened, it's opened my eyes to all these different things. And even when mom and dad do get out the fight's not gonna stop because I don't want another daughter, another, I don't want a daughter, a wife, a child. I don't want them to feel how I feel right now. So if there's things I can do to implement change, then I'm gonna do it. Your parents have been behind bars for about a year. I mean, if they end up having to serve their full sentences, mm -hmm. five, six, seven, eight years go by, this could be a lot harder. Yeah. I definitely, and there are days now to where it weighs on me so heavy to where I'm like, I can't even deal with this today. Like, I can't even talk about it. But I look at it, and I feel like the longer we go without justice, I like a good challenge. <laughs> I like a good challenge. I'm like my father. So I feel like the harder I will fight, and I will educate myself on it. I mean, what you don't know, you can't fix. So I have to educate myself and know the ins and outs of all of it in order to effectively make change. And so, yeah, it's going to be tough. I mean, I think of the times of, okay, what if I go to get engaged? Or what if I go to get married and my dad's not there? What if I go to have a kid and my parents aren't there? I, during visitation, you see a lot of, there's men of all different ages, ranging from 18, 19 years old probably, to in their 70s and you look at it and you're you're seeing people at all different phases of life so i'll see women bring their babies in and you're like that could be me like my dad could be meeting my child in prison for the first time does your mom because we've heard a lot about your dad i mean has your mom made any friends does she have people she's close to you know she sticks to herself mom sticks to herself and just tries to get through. She does a lot of reading. I send her tons of books and photos. And so she just tries to make the best of it. She misses us, obviously, more than anything in the world. So it's tough. She, she really, you know, she'll talk to people, of course. She makes her little friends, but she just kind of keeps her head down. Does she still seem like herself when you visit? We have... Especially, too, when I go on my own, we have such fun conversation, and we'll laugh and cry, and every time I go, it's like, please, next time you see your dad, please give him a hug for me. Like, please tell him I miss him and I love him so much. So it's, there's all these, that has stayed the same. But I also feel like when someone enters into prison, they have to go into self-preservation mode. You have to try to protect yourself as best as you can, especially emotionally. So, of course, there's things that I feel like have shut off, but that's her. She has to protect herself in any way that she can. And especially as a woman in the system, 
what's so sad is you see these women who, you know, which is not mom's story, but you see women who maybe come from a background of abuse and they're being thrown in a system like what we're throwing them in that just abuses them more is really tough because especially at mom's facility just three months ago one of the correctional officers was sentenced to prison for sexually abusing women there at the facility and so you look at it and you're like how are we going when are we going to get this right when are we going to stop this from happening also, when are we going to change the protocols? Because if a woman cries out and says, this guard sexually abused me, guess what happens? The woman's removed from the situation. The woman has to go to county jail, which is worse than where she's at, and the guard gets to stay there while they do an investigation. So you're still allowing that correctional officer to be in an atmosphere to where he could potentially be doing it to other women as well. So I think that's what's tough. So she just like, she keeps her head down because she's like, I don't want to be one of these women that it happens to. So there's a lot of things you have to be fearful of and a lot of just being spoken down to, you know, just yeah. being treated like an animal, which I said before, how can you expect these men and women to enter back into society and act any different when they've really just been conditioned to be hardened and to be abused and spoken down to? So they're going to treat people how they've been treated. What do you say to people who are watching this thinking, you know, they're just rich, privileged people. Of mm -hmm. course they don't like prison. Of course he's complaining and yeah. she's complaining about it. Like, come on. We've gotten that for sure. And I think what I say to people is don't even listen to our story. Listen to the over two million men and women that are incarcerated today, maybe go out on a limb and try to listen to their story and learn something different because it's not a left or right issue. A lot of people will look at this and be like, Democrat, Republican, it's not. At the end of the day, it's a humanity issue. And you look at it and you're like, you're also what I love to say is a lot of people love to get on their little high horse and say like oh well you shouldn't have done this or that and I tell people I'm like guess what you're one decision away one bad police officer one bad judge one bad prosecutor away from being in the exact same place that they're at so I would maybe not throw as many stones as you do and you look at it and you see these men and women that are consuming food that says not for human consumption not, you know, there's black mold, asbestos, lead-based paint, unclean drinking water. I mean, what, just look at the bare human necessities and how they're being treated. And so, no, I don't expect it to be a Four Seasons. I'm not sitting here saying, hey, let's put them up and let's just, you know, let's make them comfortable. No, but there's a time and place for someone to serve their consequences for their actions. But at the same time, how do you expect society to become any better if you're just beating people down? All right, so that was Savannah Chrisley, uh, and um, I'm gonna follow all this closely in terms of the appeal, but also, um, you know, the accusations that he's making about what's happening behind bars with the conditions. Because again, I find that interesting, and we'll just have to see how it all develops. I'm working on a couple of other cool stories. I was out in South Dakota shooting a story. Uh, we've got a bunch of missing stories that we're looking into still. Things get a little slow around the holidays. We're getting closer to the holidays, but um, we're running around. You guys can always contact me um, on Twitter uh, or, you know, my, I got my email listed on my Twitter too if you have any story ideas. And uh, we'll keep trying to grind them out. I hope everybody has a great, if I don't do another video before Christmas, I hope everybody has a Merry Christmas and you get to spend some time with your family. I'll get to be home for a bit. Um, and uh, I'll talk to you guys soon.